Hey, hello, welcome back to The Wintry Wyvern, and today we're trying something a little different. As some of you might have guessed, all of my videos are usually scripted to the letter, because I always try to say exactly what I mean without, you know, fumbling around with my words, but lately that's been pushing my videos later and later thanks to the hours of editing I need to make it as perfect as I can. So when a big UA like this comes out, I rarely find time to edit a full commentary. This time around we'll be a bit more late back about it. I'm recording and posting this with little to no cuts, so my reactions and opinions on these articles are pretty candid and unfiltered. There will be timestamps for each section so you can jump straight to the part that interests you and you can skip to the majority of my rambling. Anyway, today we have the Travelers of the Multiverse Unearth Arcana. Important note that this is not my first pass at reading this. I usually don't see the long-term value of posting my often faulty gut reactions. So this is after a couple hours of processing and interpreting each feature in the article. Once this is out, I'll deep dive into each race individually in their own separate videos, but for now, here's what I think so far. I've highlighted most of this article already. The key is below, from best to worst, brown is muddy or needs revision. Something that could be really good or really bad but hard to tell thanks to how it's worded. Red is broken, something way too strong to be allowed in D&D, yellow is expected, things that are par for the course but nothing too new or exciting. Green is excellent, the big hitters, features that separate the racer class in question from the rest of the pack. Blue is build defining, something that creatively and fundamentally changes the way we'd play D&D, in a level I find interesting and unique. And purple is miscellaneous thoughts that I find fun or entertaining. With that out of the way, let's jump in. This is Travelers of the Multiverse. Uh, first thing I notice at the top is that it's written by Chris Perkins and Jeremy Crawford, just a two-man team. Usually there's a third writer that's put some input into the lore or the inherent design or structure of the class. So that's like James Hyatt, uh, Mackenzie DeArmas, things like that. Uh, the fact that it's just these two kind of clarify a couple things that I think about this series right off the bat. It's that one, that most of the features, the great majority of the features are mechanically sound and time tested. So a great, a lot of the things that we're going to see are things that we have seen before, like a strong 89% of it, and the rest of it are kind of daring steps into new directions, but not anything that would blatantly break the game, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, there's not too many wild and out there ideas here, but it is very fun, very flavorful, and very rooted in classic D&D architecture. Uh, that's just my first impressions of it. Uh, we have here six races. The Astral Elf, the Autonome, the Gift, the Hadozi, the Plasmoid, and the Thrycreen. Most of you have already guessed that this feels very much like Spelljammer. The Hadozi in particular is something that is rooted in Spelljammer lore, and the Gift as well. Uh, you'll, they don't specifically say Spelljammer in this thing, but boy is it pretty darn close. Anyway, the first page is what we've seen before. Ability score increases follow the new post-Tasha's outlined that it is plus two in one stat and plus one in another, or plus one in three stats, making every race that you'll see in this document flexible to any class, in theory, which I've come to like, honestly. Languages, common plus one, as usual, creature type, blah blah blah, we've already seen all of this before, unique creature types that all have their unique little quirks to them, uh, some of them stronger or weaker than others. Lifespan, assume it's a century unless they say otherwise, we'll see them say otherwise in this document specifically. Height and weight is something that I've found a little bit contentious. Uh, that is brown, by the way. Is it brown enough? Maybe I can pick a different brown. Uh, they, they typically fall in the same ranges of height and weight that humans have in our world. The GIF, just as an example, the hippo race, is canonically about 8 to 9 feet tall. That is not a typical human height. That's taller than Goliaths. So they still classify as medium, but things like that, very specific, unique character traits that are attributed to races that basically define their overall stature, uh, separating them from dwarves, which are also medium. Um, it's pretty, a pretty big deal. I feel like they should mention that more often in the actual description block, rather than just assuming that the player knows what size they could be. But this is obviously just something that comes along with all the races being setting agnostic should you choose them to be. They don't really tap into the cultural aspects of each race as much as they could. Anyway, first race is Astral Elf. Long ago, groups of elves ventured from the Feywild to the Astral Plane to be closer to their gods. Kind of makes sense, the Feywild is a little bit more of the inner planes, uh, closer to the material plane, while Arvander, where most of the elven pantheon, the Seldarine, are uh, living and existing, 
is considered an astral dominion, one of many planes or demiplanes that are connected to many others by a uh, route of the astral sea. So moving to space is kind of logical. Uh, life in the Silver Void has imbued their souls with a spark of divine light, a little bit of holy uh, flavor here. The light manifests in a starry gleam in an astral elf's eyes. Because nothing ages in the material plane, astral elves that from that plane are thousands of years old and their longevity gives them an unusual perspective on time. Some are prone to melancholy while others display an absence of feeling. Many look for creative ways to occupy themselves. When they choose to live in pod contemplation or strike out to explore, they tend to see things through the lens of times and having little to no meaning to them. If they don't dwell on the astral plane, they live as long as all other elves, just around 750 years old. I personally love elves as a concept. The longevity of the race is very important to defining how they view the world and how they interact with their party, which usually, usually lives much less than them, a much, a much shorter life than them. Something, two things that make elves unique is one, their perspective on longevity, because they witness so much and experience so much and have the opportunity to act on so much that they choose not to. They kind of pick and choose their battles more than humans do who have very fleeting lives and interact with everything that they can. Elves have that wide perspective that something that affects them now will affect them centuries later, will have impact on them centuries later, and makes them a little more reticent from um, engaging in too much. That, plus that they have the concept of reincarnation granted to them by the Seldarin. Elves, during the first hundred years of their life, as defined by Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, they witness within their trances the collective experiences of their past lives, very Avatar-esque, that they tap into lives that they have previously lived and witness them and experience them as if they're their own. And then after a hundred years are over, they start trancing about their own memories finally. This gives them the perspective of multiple lives, not only their singular life, and gives them a unique touch of perspective that no other race in d and I feel, can quite connect to as easily. There are people with divine connections like Kalishtar or uh, ASMR, but to see your own life over and over again in different perspectives is just so wholly unique, and it's something that I love um, in elves in general. Uh, we'll see a little bit of that touch and trans proficiencies when we get to that later, but for now, let's talk about their starting things. Anything in yellow is everything that elves usually have. It's just a usual stat block. Humanoid, medium, 30 feet walk speed, dark vision, phantasy, Keen senses, trance. I'm glad that's out of the way, because those are all just things we always see in every elf stat block. I want to touch on trance for a little bit. You can finish a long rest in four hours if you spend those hours in a trance-like meditation. This is not so much a change, because it is reworded from previous trance versions. This is not so much a buff or nerf as much as it is a clarification. Trance has always been that kind of thing that is like, oh, do they really need eight hours? Is it four hours trance, four hours light activity? Is it, uh, is it just four hours long? Now they're finally clarifying that it is just four hours long. And that's it. You're done with your long rest after four hours. Perfect. This is something that I expect to see ported over to every elf in retrospect, perhaps through errata or something like that. But uh, great change. Just really like that they finally clarified that. Anyway, Astral Fire. Uh, you know one of the following cantrips of your choice, Dancing Lights, Light, or Sacred Fame. So something about this, not only it's very... Uh, thematic for star-based elves is that it is very similar to the half-elf variants. So half-elves get to choose between a number of different abilities, uh, and one of them is called cantrip. You get to choose from one you get to choose one cantrip from the wizard spell list, and intelligence is your casting modifier to use it, which would normally allow you to use dancing lights and light, so that's not entirely new to elves in particular because half-elves have already had it. But Sacred Flame is entirely new because this is something very specific to clerics and has never been a choice for half-elves to choose. Sacred Flame isn't even available to Asimar, uh, which is the typecast holy race. So this is a really interesting ability and obviously you can use Intelligence, Wisdom, or Charisma just like all of the races introduced into 2021. Very cool, very flexible. I wish all races retrospectively had something like this, but great, great ability, very flavorful. Radiant Soul. When you succeed on a death save, succeed on a death save is an interesting game mechanic that has not been tapped into very often. Um, you can regain an, it's an interesting trigger, basically. You can regain a number of hit points equal to your proficiency bonus plus your Int Wizard Cobb modifier. Choose when you select this race. You can't use this race trait again until you finish a long rest. So, 
Proficiency bonus plus int whizcaw is basically 5 to 10 HP. If you fail, if you succeed on a death save, then you will you can choose to gain back 10 HP. I don't see why you wouldn't, because this doesn't cost an action at all, which is wonderful. It's just like rolling a nat 20, except better. So it basically turns your 10 to 20 rolls into nat 20 rolls once, if that makes sense. Once per long rest. Really great ability. Really fantastic. Kind of reminds me of Celestial Soul Warlock. I think that's the one, or is it Divine Soul Sorcerer that has an ability like this, where you can immediately gain hit points and uh, just be back in the fight. Very useful, very flavorful. Again, trance has been revised to be great. Trance proficiencies. When you proficient, when you finish a long rest using your trance trait, you gain two proficiencies, each one with a weapon or a tool of your choice. Again, this taps into something that half elves already had. Uh, they have what is it called? Uh, elf weapon training lets you learn four weapons of your uh, as described four very specific weapons So what this does is that it allows you to take a weapon that you would normally not be proficient in and just have that proficiency I don't see you switching that too often. It doesn't feel like something that you Switch every long rest. It feels like something you choose right at the start of your campaign something that you want to build around uh, Perhaps like a wizard with a great axe proficiency would that would be really neat um and you just keep that for the whole for the whole entirety of your adventuring career. Unless you get a really cool great sword later, then you can switch to great sword instead. Uh, tool proficiency is notoriously pretty darn useful. Um, if you want to have thieves tools or something like that, um, it's not game breaking. It's very good. Uh, it's not skill proficiencies, which I believe are to be much stronger than weapon or tool proficiencies, but it is pretty handy. But I do love the flavor at the end. You mystically acquire these proficiencies by drawing them from shared elven memory, and you retain them until you finish your long rest. This is, again, tapping into the past lives concept, that you're able to witness past lives through your trancing. Wonderful callback to a great piece of lore that I real, feel like really should define elves more often. Overall, they're all pretty, I guess. I mean, starry elves? Who doesn't want that? Stat block is pretty standard. All these yellows are just normal elf stuff. Radiant Soul, very useful once. Uh, Sacred Flame, kind of cool. You could put that on any caster you want. No longer have to multi-class into Cleric or take Mage Initiate to grab that. And Trance Proficiencies makes you pretty flexible. Uh, it doesn't lend itself to any specific class in particular, but well, it's pretty neat. Uh, not my favorite, but nice to have. <laughs> Let's keep going. This is what happens when I... Uh, don't script things. Auto gnome. I feel like there's a theme song calling to me when I say auto gnome. Uh, auto gnomes are mechanical beings built by rock gnomes in their image, usually with a particular purpose. Uh, they are a steadfast colleague or loyal companion built to be so, sometimes malfunction. Really flavorful. Bears a resemblance to Crater. That's kind of neat. And most auto gnomes are programmed to speak and understand gnomish. This is one of those examples where they suggest a language for you to take for your common plus one. Uh, you don't have to, but I don't see why you wouldn't if your creator is always a gnome. Like, it doesn't really make sense for an elven inventor to create an autonome. It, so why would you need to learn any other language? Unless it is to speak a language that your creator doesn't know for, like, utility purposes. Anyway, internal components used in the autonome's manufacture can vary wildly. Uh, might have an actual beating heart in the chest cavity that's gnarly, and I love it while another might be powered by stardust or intricate clockwork gears. Very cool. Roll on the autonome history table or choose an entry to determine what events set your autonome on the path. What a, yeah. And gnomes can live for centuries up to 500 years. Again, stating the age in the description, but not making it mandatory by putting in the stat block. It's just, just cool. Autonome history is great. Just a whole lot of reasons why your robo friend would want to adventure on their own. They give you autonomy. The creator died. Malfunction. Glitch. Stolen. Treated, uh unfairly by your creator you built for a special mission or trapped in a role and you abandoned your creator it's basically every story to every robot in history from mega man to wally -E to uh i don't know uh baymax <laughs> just any reason why a creation might venture out on their own it's just great i don't know traits let's start from the top you are a construct okay so when we talk about construct, there's a, lot, a couple of contexts that we have to bring up. The first one is the reborn race. The reborn race, when pitched in the UA, was originally humanoid plus construct or undead. And when it officially shipped, they removed the undead and they removed the construct. 
mostly because they wanted to simplify it for people, um, but also because they had some problematic drawbacks, which were that they couldn't be healed by common healing spells. Now, the way they've gone about fixing this is this feature over on the bottom here called, uh, from True Life. In addition, your creator designed you to benefit from common spells that preserve life but normally don't affect conjure jokes. Cure wounds, healing word, and spare the dying. Great. Wonderful. Now, now this this creature type is no longer a detriment to the class. The biggest problem we had is specifically with undead, most first and foremost, is that these variant creature types were not a buff to the class at all. They were flavorful, but they actually made the class weaker, which is just, in general, not very fun. Uh, the fact that you can finally be a construct and you keep that immunity to charm hold the dominate person, the normal charm spells that affect humanoids, is just a great little flavorful thing that I really appreciate. Um, again, we'll talk about Warforged later, who are curiously humanoid and not construct, but another topic. Size, you're small. Great, you're a gnome. Speed, walking speed is 30 feet. Interesting point about this is that gnomes are 25 feet movement speed. And in perspective, small races have always been able to tap into 30 feet from goblins and kobolds who have 30 feet. Back in, I don't know, 2015, 2016, they've always been able, walking speed for a small creature has always been, 30 feet's always been an option for small races, basically. But the fact that they walk faster than their creator counterparts, interesting choice. I don't think this is a contextual, flavorful choice. Um, it's not that they naturally walk faster. That's not why they're doing this. I think they're doing this specifically because Wizards of the Coast have realized that 25-foot walking speed is not fun. In a game based around 30 feet, 60 feet, 120 feet ranges, just being barely unable to escape certain ranges from your enemies is a detrimental experience, and it's not very entertaining. Over the long course of the adventuring career, being able to not being able to run as fast as your teammates is just burdensome. And I think they've realized that maybe if we just give them 30 feet walk speed, they can enjoy small races more. A lot of small races are notoriously not as popular as normal sized races. And this is just a step in the right direction, in my opinion. Uh, some people will be like, but it uh, ruins uh, immersion. Whatever. Uh, 30 feet is fun, 25 feet is not. Armored casing. When you're encased in thin metal or some other durable material, or you are encased in thin metal or some other durable material, when you aren't wearing armor, your armor class is 13 plus dex. Great ability. It's basically mage armor without having to spend a spell slot and without being able to be dispelled. You can still wear a shield with this, which makes it wonderful, and it does open up possibilities for classes that uh, don't like using armor. I think it's just a good, good ability. Uh, 13 to 18 AC is not egregious. It's not overly powerful. And it's not a flat plus one like Warforged, so I think it's fine. The next ability is built for success. You can add a d4 to one attack roll, ability check, or saving throw you make, and you can do so after seeing the d20, but before the effects are resolved, a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus per long rest. Just a generally good ability. Uh, this could be best compared to Gnome Cunning, something you find in the Gnome stat block, advantage on saving throws to Int Wiz and Ka saving throws. It's not as strong but it does tap into the same, just a little bit luckier uh, concept that gnomes have. So it's pretty solid. Uh, not build defining at all, but uh, adding a d4 to a saving throw. If anybody's been affected by bless, you know this is amazing. Uh, let's keep going. Mechanical nature, resistance to poison and immunity to disease, and you have advantage on saving throws against being paralyzed or poisoned. All right, so when we talk about auto gnome, <laughs> The name just keeps striking me. We have to talk about Warforged, which is the other robo race that, strangely enough, isn't a construct, but rather a humanoid. Uh, mechanical nature is very similar to the ability constructed resilience in that it gives you resistance to poison damage, resistance to uh, advantage on saving throws against being poisoned, and immunity to disease. Something entirely new is advantage against being paralyzed, which is pretty neat, and it kind of makes sense for a construct sort of race. You don't need to eat, drink, or breathe, which is also something that the Warforged have, and Sentry's Rest, which when you take a long rest, you spend at least six hours in an inactive motionless state instead of sleeping, and in this state you appear inert, but you aren't unconscious. But the thing that is missing from this that the Warforged have is that uh, the Warforged cannot be put to sleep. Uh, mechanical Nature and Sentry's Rest in Auto Gnome don't necessarily imply that you cannot be affected by the sleep spell. Uh, and it doesn't say that you can't sleep in general, which is a little bit curious and I think a little bit missing 
Uh, will they put add that in? Maybe. It's not really a deal breaker in any sort of regard. So, uh, moving on, specialized design, you gain two tool proficiencies of your choice. Now, Warforged also had an ability like this, also called specialized design, I believe, that gave them one tool proficiency and one skill proficiency, which I'd argue was a little bit better. But tool, two, two tool proficiencies does lean into the autonome being designed for a very specific purpose, as designed by their creator. Two tool proficiencies is exactly that. A totally unique feature that we haven't seen in the Warforged is True Life. If the Mending Spells cast on you, you can expend a hit die, roll it, and regain a number of hit points equal to the roll, plus your con mod minimum of one hit point. So the Mending Spell takes a minute to cast, which means that if you have this cast on you, it would take a minute to receive those hit points back, but it is absolutely faster than having to wait to the one hour mark to finish your short rest and be able to spend these hit dice. If you want to spend 10 hit dice in 10 minutes, you can use true life 10 times and it is perfectly fine. An interesting detail about this is that mending does not have to be cast by you, it only has to be cast on you, which is fantastic. Um, you can have a character or a party member next to you who also has uh, kind of a creator background that can repair you if they so choose. It would be a cool dynamic. Again, this does allow you to uh, tap into or be able to utilize common spells that would normally not affect constructs, cure wounds, healing word, and spare the dying. Great. Awesome. Overall, Auto Gnome, pretty strong. Pretty good. All the features that they have here are just very solid. Not necessarily build defining, but just very good to have on any class. Build for success is a great little boost. Mechanical nature gives you a ton of great resistances, immunities, and advantages, which makes you very resistant to a very wide array of common afflictions. Sentry's Rest is neat, Specialized Design is neat, True Life is pretty handy situationally useful. Overall, good. I like it. It's like a tiny robot, and I think a lot of people are going to have a lot of fun with that, even though it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't necessarily have to be a gnome aesthetically, but boy, it can fit into a lot of different storylines that way. Really fun. Anyway, moving on to the GIF. Boy, do I love the GIF. I just love the imagery. I love the art. I love their lore. Will this stat block match up to that? We'll find out. They're broad shouldered, tall folk with hippo like features, smooth skin, others have short bristles, impressive size, unforgettable appearance, storytelling is a rich tradition, uh, they love storytelling, they like, like brawling, they love being jovial, the gif is split into two camps concerning if they are pronounced with a hard G or a soft G, do I have to explain the joke? Not really. Uh, disagreements over the correct pronunciation often blossom into hard feelings, loud arguments, love this, love this, I hope they keep this, I hope this makes it into the book. Um, gift traits. So before we go into this, I did want to once again iterate the height and weight argument. GIF are typically eight to nine feet tall. Very tall. Taller than Goliaths. Taller than, uh, just as tall as bugbears. And not just as tall as, uh, not bugbears. Um, what's that one race that's really tall? The one that Caduceus is? Boy, I'm blanking. Furbolts. Fur they're just as tall as furbolts. Um, but the stat block doesn't at all talk about that. Um, doesn't talk about much at all uh, much at all about their lore actually but uh we'll address that once we finish the stat block creature type your humanoid size you are medium but just barely speed your speed your walking speed is 30 feet and you have a swim speed equal to your walking speed okay so gif aren't really known for swimming they're big hippos yes but they're militaristic they're pompous they wield firearms they travel space they don't really swim. And I get that hippos swim, but even hippos don't really swim. They kind of just walk on the bottom of seabeds. They're kind of, yeah, they're not really known for their swimming. Um, and the th interesting thing about this is that they might have a swim speed in the stat block, but they don't have what is usually given to swimming speed races, which is amphibious. They can't breathe air and water. And they also don't have hold breath, so they can't breathe, they can't hold their breath for an hour. So they're just things that go underwater and hold their breath like normal people. It's, <laughs> it's kind of, I feel like something's missing here. I feel like this is kind of tacked on because you're like, oh, hippos can swim, but they don't really, not even hippos really swim. They just kind of walk in water. Um, kind of a weird trait to give them. It's good. Swimming is good, but it's not like something gif are known for 
if that makes sense. Anyway, moving on to damage dealer. Like a hippopotamus in a crystal ware shop, you are naturally adept at damaging things. Love that. When you roll a one on a damage die for a melee attack, you can re-roll the die and use a new roll. You can do this you can do so no more than once per turn. Okay, so this is basically the savage attacker feat, you know, the one that nobody takes. <laughs> um, the fact that you can re-roll an attack once per turn, if it's a one, it has to be a melee attack, which is Again, kind of silly, because even though they're big and lumbering, they're, like, practiced. You know? They're... just look at look at the picture. They're, like, army folk. They're, um, rigor, rig, regimented, and they usually use firearms or long-range attacks. Um, this kind of paints them as clumsy, I guess? Um, and kind of ignores the lore that has been built for them. It's good. It's definitely great. It, it's it's good for melee attackers that don't want to take savage attacker and they can reroll a die. That's wonderful. Uh, I also do think that once per turn abilities are a bit cumbersome, especially in the virtual tabletop space. Um, but I guess it's it's good. It's strong. Yeah, like mechanically, it's sound. Aesthetically, kind of a bit counterintuitive. Anyway, hippo build. Let's talk about this one. You have advantage on strength based. Uh, ability checks and strength saving throws. In addition, you count as one size larger for determining your carrying capacity in which you can push, drag, or lift. The second half, we've seen it so many times. It's on orcs, it's on bugbears, it's on goliaths. It's useful, not situationally useful. But the fact that you have advantage on strength, chase, strength based ability checks and strength saving throws. It's. So, there's only two places to really find that. There's three, but we'll talk about the third one later. Um, it is. Barbarian's Rage, which gives you resistance, plus this advantage, and Giant Smite, uh, found in the Rune Knight Fighter. The thing is, is that this ability is great. It is wonderful to have on anyone who wants to grapple. If anybody knows me or has played games with me, they know that I love to play grappling builds. I've played five different classes of grappling builds, and I very much enjoy it. I feel like it adds a layer of complexity to the Barbarian class, which is um, notoriously lacking in depth. But... This ability is kind of missing the added benefit of resilience that the Barbarian gets when they grapple, and is missing the benefit of grappling huge creatures that the Rune Knight Fighter gets. So the question is, where does this fit in into the D&D landscape? Well, the goal, or the, um, the advantage of this, is that it can lend itself to races, and it lends itself to classes that don't typically find themselves in grappling scenarios, or not without multi-classing into fighter or barbarian so the first thing that comes to mind immediately is paladins paladins are a strength-based race who can make very much use of grapple prone with their smites it's an incredible combo um other fighters that are not rune knight fighter can make great use of this which is the battle master fighter for example who with the maneuvers can easily knock somebody prone and have great and can knock someone into an advan a grapple state very quickly uh this would be wonderful for them um the fact that it does not raise the ceiling of grappling talent, but rather widens the playing scape of grapple, <laughs> grapple, grappling capable characters. It's something that I really enjoy, and I like this ability in general. I do, I really do. Um, overall, thematically, I'm a bit disappointed. I feel like the GIF have a very clear aesthetic that makes them much more than lumbering hippos, and I feel like this stat block is more of a hippo folk stat block and not a GIF stat block. Does that make sense? I feel like that should make sense. Um, it's missing a lot of the flavor that came with the original race that made people really want to play it. Um, not, you can always tack on those cultural values. Yes, that is true. Um, and this is just kind of a, not a consequence, but a casualty of the, uh, of the fact that they are removing a lot of cultural features from physical stat blocks. Does that make sense? Uh, it's good. You know, it really convinces me to play a melee attacker. It really wants me to get up and close and personal. That's the real energy that this gift, gift stat block is giving me. I enjoy it. I like it. I'll probably use it. Um, but if I want to play one of those spacefaring, gun-toting, pompous, militaristic gifts, this is not the ideal stat block for them. And please fix this sim for swimming speed. That is questionable at best. Um, anyway, moving on to the Hadozi. Hadozi, Hadozi, Hadoze, 
I'll go with Hidozi for now. Hidozi are people with simian features that long ago adapted to live among the tall trees of their home world. They're natural climbers with feet as dexterous as their hands, even to the extent of opposable thumbs. Membranes of skin hang loosely under arms and legs. Kinda gross. When stretched taut, these membranes enable a Hidozi to glide. First, Hidozi were hunted by na large natural predators to in this hostile environment. They developed a natural instinctual sense of community. They make great friends. Safety in numbers. Wonderful. Great. Hidozi traits. You are humanoid. You are medium or small. Great. The number of people who want to play small baby monkeys. You have been rewarded today. Speed. Your walking speed is 30 feet. And you have a climbing speed equal to your walking speed. Climbing speed is always amazing. Uh, I don't care what anyone says. Being able to climb walls is infinitely useful. Much better than swimming speed. Um, not as good as flying speed, but you know, we'll get to that. Dexterous feet. You can take the use an object action as a bonus action. This is great. Wow, this is great. So if you find yourself with a dumb amount of money and you can just buy healing potions, this is just a healing word, but better. Um, of course, it costs money. Um, I can most like most easily see it as, you know, opening a door, using a po uh, opening a door is an object interaction, but using a potion on yourself and on your friends. That's wonderful. It's no longer. Usually that's a homebrew rule to use a potion as a bonus action, but now it doesn't have to be. Um, you can just walk up to a friend, give him a healing potion, and just go about your turn normally. Very, very useful ability. Uh, glide, if you're not incapacitated or wearing heavy armor, you can extend your skin membranes. Doesn't roll off the tongue. And glide. When you can do so, you can perform the following aerial maneuvers. When you fall, you can move up to five feet horizontally for every one foot you descend. Okay. Let's talk about this. Um... Again, let's, uh, this is a rule that has not been formally clarified by Wizards of the Coast. So this has been seen before. Uh, we can look at the Simic Hybrid who can grow manta ray wings and they can move two feet horizontally for every one foot they descend. So if they fall 30 feet, they can move 60 feet. This, if you fall 30 feet, you can move 150 feet. So the point that I wish would be clarified is does horizontal movement given to you by gliding count as movement on your turn? Does it consume movement? My guess is yes. It would make sense that if you fall 5 feet and you move 30 feet forward, that would consume your 30 feet movement speed. That just kind of makes sense. Out of combat, perfectly fine. Climb up a tall cliff, glide across the river 500 feet, uh, land on the other side perfectly safely. Good. Flavorful. It works. In combat, it's a bit counterintuitive that you could fall 5 feet which is free, by the way. Falling is free and does not cost movement. And then move 30 feet, but then be stopped by kind of an invisible wall because your movement speed ends at 30 feet. Um, even though you could keep falling if you so choose. You could keep falling 60 feet, 100 feet, 500 feet, actually, by according to Xanathars. But you can only move 30 feet horizontally or an amount equal to your walking speed. So you would kind of glide 30 feet and then pause. And then next turn, you could glide another 30 feet and then pause, and you could keep gliding technically for six turns straight um, as you're falling for free. It's log it mechanically it makes sense, but logically or intuitively, it's a bit hard to wrap your head around, at least for newer players. So I would like to have a little bit of a blurb at the bottom that would kind of clarify that. Anyway, when you would take damage from a fall, you can use your reaction to reduce the fall's damage to zero. Dang, that's really good. <laughs> um, there's a whole feature called Slow Fall that the monk gets at later levels that lets you reduce this damage quite a bit. Um, but now it's zero, which is very useful. Um, kind of could be build defining if you want to play a more aerial fighter. Obviously, flying characters, if knocked prone, will fall and take damage for it, but now will no longer do so. Again, falling is entirely free and usually it does have consequences, but for this race, it doesn't, which is really cool. Um, say you grapple somebody, move somebody up to the tall tree and fall, they'll take damage, but you won't. Very neat. Overall, yeah, great race. People have been asking for a monkey race for a good amount of time. Uh, if you don't want to glide, if you want, don't want a gliding monkey, I guess you could just ignore the gliding feature. But otherwise, it's a pretty short stat block and pretty simple. Um, there are a bit of there are a handful of technicalities that come with gliding um, that have to be ironed out, but more clarified uh, than problematic, if that makes sense. Uh, this is a pretty good race, pretty solid. Uh, does fit the flavor. I don't know how much more you could add to a monkey race. I'm sure there's like things you could do with its tail or uh, object interactions, which they kind of tried with dexterous feet, but it's solid. I like it. All right, so let's talk about plasmoids. 
Uh, plasmoids are amorphous beings with no typical shape. In the presence of other folk, they often adopt a similar form, but there's little chance of mistaking a plasmoid for anything else. They consume food by osmosis, the way an amoeba does, and excrete waste by tiny pores. They breathe by absorbing oxygen through another set of pores, and their limbs are strong and flexible enough to grasp and manipulate weapons and tools. Kind of. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Although most plasmoids are translucent gray, they can alter their color and translucence by absorbing dyes through their pores. So if you want to be a blob that's not gray, you visit a paint shop and just buy all <laughs> the paints and dyes and you can be whatever color you want. That's that's great. That's wonderful. Plasmids don't have internal organs. Their bodies are composed of cells, fibers, and plasma-like ooze, and clusters of nerves called ganglia. I love how they, they mention ganglia like it's a fantasy term. Ganglia are real things that real people have, and the definition of ganglia are clusters of nerves. They didn't feel the need to describe cells, fibers, or plasma, assuming that people know what that is, but <laughs> they had to, they felt like ganglia, which is a bit just too big for our vocabulary, which is funny to me. Um, these nerves uh, enable a plasma to detect light, heat, texture, sound, pain, and vibrations, just like normal people. They can skiff, stiffen their outer layers of their bodies to maintain a human-like shape so they can wear clothing or accessories, but not forever, as I'll describe later. They speak by forcing air out of their tubular cavities that constrict to produce sound. Gross, and I love it. When plasmoids sleep, they lose their rigidity and spread out like a pancake like a rock, like a table, and they're sometimes mistaken for a rock or some other feature of the environment. I feel like a spread out blob is hard to mistake for a rock, but I'll just let that slide. Um, you have the following racial traits. Creature type, you are an ooze. Okay, now somebody can test my knowledge here, but I don't think there are any race or class features that affect oozes specifically. If they affect oozes, they affect anything. There's nothing that singles out oozes, if that makes sense. Um, it's just a great race. I love it. Um, you can correct me. And maybe there's an item that affects oozes. If someone wants to clarify that and post it in the comments, by all means, you're welcome to. You are size medium or small. You choose a size when you gain this race. Makes sense. Somebody's been watching some anime. Speed. Your walking speed is 30 feet. Great. Uh, amorphous, you can squeeze through a space as narrow as one inch wide, providing you are wearing or carrying nothing. You also have advantage on ability checks you make to initiate or escape a grapple. Let's talk about the first part. You can squeeze through a space as narrow as one inch wide. This is something that has very recently been taken out of the fairy step lock, moving from Under Thurkana to the official release in Wild Beyond the Witchlight. Um, it was deemed as problematic mostly because it was a magical effect, and uh, it was hard to quantify if they were still the same size or not, but with oozes, it kind of just makes sense. You kind of just can. We've been fighting gelatinous cubes for decades now. It kind of just makes sense that you can squish through it one inch wide, and it's not so hard to understand as much as it was with a fairy who could kind of, who still kind of had a humanoid shape and consistency. Anyway, provided you are wearing and carrying nothing. So what this means is that you drop all your weapons, your shields, your armor, your magic items, your trinkets, your hats, your clothing, all that you leave in a bag, give it to your Goliath friend, and you squeeze through. That is so funny to me that <laughs> after you're done doing this, you just kind of got to redress yourself. Um, if, if you're wearing heavy armor, you got to take 10 or however long it takes to put that on, which is a while. Um, and you also have advantage on ability checks you make to initiate or escape a grapple. Lots of love to grapplers lately. I love it. Um, this means you have an advantage on both athletics and acrobatics checks when in the context of grappling, which is so good. So, so good. Dark vision, you can see in dim light, wonderful. Important point about this, oozes don't have dark vision, they have blind sight. Oozes have blind, they don't have eyes, so they don't really have dark vision, but of course, giving blind sight to, uh, to a player race is busted, so it has to be dark vision. Uh, I feel like an author that is not Jeremy Crawford or Chris Perkins would try to do something here uh, and give like some limited blind sight, but I think their experience with um, balance testing has shown that dark vision is just a safer thing to give here, uh, even though thematically they really should have blind sight. Anyway, hold breath. You can hold your breath for one hour. Boy, I feel like there's a hippo race I would really appreciate hold breath. I wonder which one that is. Uh, <laughs> it's good. Natural resilience, you have resistance against acid and poison damage. Two resistances here, which is wonderful. And you have advantage on saving throws against being poisoned. Solid. Makes sense. Your news. Shape self. Now, this is just 
such a pleasure to read. If you're not incapacitated, you can reshape your body to give yourself a head, one or two arms, one or two legs, and makeshift hands and feet, or you can revert to a limbless blob. No action required. So you could just keep, you could do this as many times as you want on your turn. You could just keep popping in and out at <laughs> one of your hands and your feet. Uh, as a bonus action, you can extrude an pseudopod that is up to six inches wide and 10 feet long or reabsorb it into your body. You can use this to manipulate an object, open and unlock door or container, store, store or retrieve an item from a container, pour out a container, can't attack, no act, no magic items, and they can't carry more than 10 pounds. This is flavorful, if anything. It's very limited in use in terms of practical practicality. It's more of a flavor thing here. Um, open and unlock door is neat. Um, it, it, I guess it would be too powerful to allow it to open locked doors. You probably have to slip through with your one inch space, end up on the other side, reform back into a normal person, and then use a proper thieves tool trick. Um, but I understand. Uh, it would kind of be, I wish they could open lock doors, but it's fine. For ballast reasons, it's fine. Uh, overall, great race. I love it. I mean, I don't really have any corrections or fixes here. I feel like they really hit the ooze aesthetic without compromising how strong they could be or their natural talents. I'm sure there are a couple things we could give them, like a consume ability, but that'd be kind of grimy and weird to implement. Um, the things that they have are just thematically appropriate. So a lot of them are very good in general. So I would very much look forward to playing one of these races. I think it would just be just a blast and very fun. Just a really fun... I, could just already, I can already have and see a whole lot of really fun concepts and ideas for this. But let's move on to the last race, the Thrycreen. Some people say Threecreen. I feel like that's weird. If there's a three cream, there should be a two cream and a one cream, but thry cream is how I think it's pronounced. Thry cream are insectile, have insectile features and two pairs of arms. Very important. Their bodies are encased in a protective chitin. They can alter the coloration of their carapace to blend in with their natural surroundings. They don't sleep, but they still require to be inactive, so they basically might as well sleep. During these periods, they are fully conscious and aware of what's happening around them. This whole first two paragraphs are basically the stat block. I feel like there could have been more flavor thrown into these, because these are basically repeated word for word in the actual stat block. We'll get to it. Thrycreens speak by clacking their mandibles and waving their antenna, indicating to other Tricreen what they're thinking and feeling. Fun thing about this, Tricreen in the Monster Manual have a language called Thrycreen. They're just a language named after themselves. Um, and if you're not allowed to take, I, you better ask your DM if you're allowed to take the language Thrycreen. Nobody will understand you, but it kind of just makes sense. Um, <laughs> and nobody else can learn it because, uh, as it says here, other creatures find this method of communication difficult to interpret and impossible to duplicate. Nobody else can speak Thrycreen. To interact with other folk, Thrycreen rely on a form of telepathy. All right, so now that we've read the stat block, let's read the stat block. Thrycreen traits. You are a monstrosity. Okay, fun thing about this, in the monster manual released 2014, 2015, I don't remember, um, Thrycreen are humanoids. They're considered humanoids, um, which means that in the Monsters of the Multiverse book that's coming out in 2022, Thrycreen will probably be changed to monstrosities instead. Monstrosities as a player race were once an option for centaurs and minotaurs in the original UA that they came out in, but they were eventually retconned. Minotaurs were returned were turned into humanoids, and satyrs were not satyrs. Centaurs were turned into fake creatures. None of them kept the monstrosity uh, creature type which is making its return here. I believe it tried to make a return somewhere else, but I can't remember. Um, but yeah, it's try they're trying again. Uh, there's no real problems with monstrosity races, I'm gonna be honest with you. Again, immune to charm, hold, and dominate person, which is a great feature to have. Medium or small, which means that you can be a baby, baby, um, you'd be a baby grasshopper if you'd like to be. Uh, medium or small, speed, walking speed, 30 feet, great. Camilla and Carapace, very similar to the auto gnome. Um, you can have an armor of 13 plus your dex mod, which is solid. It's good. Um, as an action, you can change the color of your carapace to match the color and texture of your surroundings, giving you advantage on stealth checks made to hide. So my question about this and why I colored it brown, which is a little bit confusing, is because does this ability work if you're wearing armor, which covers your carapace, right? If, if the thematic flavor is that your carapace is what's allowing you to texture into your surroundings, then wearing any sort of armor should invalidate that. I don't think they clarify it enough that it's clear um, and an um, actionable thing that a DM can say, well, you're wearing armor over your body, so you cannot use this chameleon effect. Um, there should be a little bit of a trade-off to have advantage on stealth checks to hide. 
it just makes sense to me. Anyway, Dark Vision, perfect. Uh, Thry Queen always had Dark Vision. Secondary Arms. Boy, let's talk about this. You have two slightly smaller secondary arms below your primary pair of arms. The secondary arms function like your primary arms with the following exceptions. You can use them to wield light weapons, but no other kind of weapons, and you can't wield a shield. Okay, so this is a discussion. What do you do when you have four arms? So there's three things that come to mind immediately. Um, the first thing is that you now have two arms that are available for grappling. Uh, to the total of four, so you can grapple four things if you really want to. The second thing that I see here that is an option is wielding light weapons in combination with other things. So dual wielding requires both of your hands to hold light weapons. You can attack it as an action and attack on the bonus action. Now what you can do is you can wield a great axe in your primary hands and then wield light weapons in your secondary arms. So if you have extra attack, you can make an attack with your great axe you can make an attack with your light weapon, like a scimitar. And because you've made an attack with your light weapon, you can use your bonus action to attack with a scimitar as well as for a total of three attacks in a turn, which is not something that any other race can do. To swing with a heavy weapon, a light weapon, and a light weapon. Pretty great. Um, the third thing that's pretty darn obvious is that you can use a shield. So you can have a shield, you can have a long sword, and you can have two scimitars if you'd like and still gain the benefit of three attacks plus two AC. Um, you can also use those extra arms to hold arcane foci, which is wonderful. You can use them to hold items on deck or just hold a myriad of weapons that you want to use, but not necessarily have to use on the turn that you're holding them, if that makes sense. So secondary arms is absolutely build defining. If you're picking a Thrykreen, you have something in mind for when you use these secondary arms, whether it be a whole myriad of martial weapons, whether it be a shield and sword, plus two more weapons, a great axe plus two more weapons, an arcane foci in another hand. It is definitely a conversation you have to have in your with your DM if a Thrykreen is appropriate for the campaign you're running. There's going to be a ton of power gamers saying that, oh, you could just pick a Thrykreen for an optimal amount of damage. But if your DM is willing to allow a Thrykreen into your campaign, they also have to be okay that there will be a slight bump in damage. And it's not going to be game breaking. It's not going to be super overwhelming. And it's not going to overshadow the party. You just kind of have to accept that this is something that a Thrykreen can do. It's just part of their race. And anything less than this would feel like it is... Um, it feels like a Thrykreen kind of deserves this, I guess, if that makes sense. It's part of the flavor. It's part of the package. Anyway, I don't think it's busted. I think a lot of people are going to say it is, but eh, whatever. They got to grow up. Sleepless revitalization. You do not require sleep, and you can choose to remain conscious during a long rest. Cool. Nice. Thrykreen telepathy. You have the magical ability to communicate mentally with any number of willing creatures you can see within 120 feet of you. So this is wonderful it, it has no person limit it has no time limit the only limit is the range so you can communicate with an entire room if you'd like to you can send a message to an entire ballroom all at once uh announcing your arrival if you so choose uh the creature doesn't need to share language with you it just needs to be able to understand one language and it's broken if you move more than 120 feet apart if you're incapacitated or either of you mentally break the contact no action required so this is something that i have about mental telepathy in general in D&D is that it is impossible well, without weapons or a specific feature it is impossible to refuse a mental connection I feel like there should be an option to just kind of block out a mental contact like a phone call that you can just turn off I know you can't do that with people talking out loud but it kind of just feels a little bit intrusive the things like sending and mental telepathy is just always speaking to your head all the time and there's nothing really you can do to to stop that. It says you can mentally break the contact, but it doesn't mean that the contact can't just be restarted, if that makes sense. Anyway, looking at this race in full. Monstrosity, uh, advantage on stealth checks, natural AC, secondary arms, telepathy, great package. Really strong mechanically. Really capable, I think. And that kind of fits into their aesthetic. Um, would I allow this into my campaign? Probably. I mean, it, as long as the setting kind of lends itself to it, um, people are going to be up in arms hey, <laughs> about uh, having multiple arms or having uh, things that other characters can't do. But that's the whole point of picking races or that unique advantage. And it's not like super imbalance. It's just an extra attack. 
and if they don't invest in it, if they don't have two-weapon fighting, if they don't have a dual wielder, then they won't get the normal advantages that you would normally get from two-weapon fighting. So they're still going to have to invest in it if they really want it to work, and that's perfectly fine because dual wielding has always been just a little bit weak in the D&D sphere. Anyway, overall, looking at this whole package, Thrycreen, Hidozi, Plasmoid, Gif, Autonome, Astral Elf, I like them. Honestly, I do. Um... They're uniquely distinct from a number of races that have come out recently. They have their own little flavors, and they're not inherently busted, I don't think. Um, kind of lends itself that this is only a two-man team of Perkins and Crawford, very experienced in the D&D sphere. They didn't try anything too wild, but they definitely tried a couple new things, like creature types and such like that. Still kind of disappointed in the GIF, gonna be honest with you. I feel like if you replace the word GIF with a, swingy, with a swimming orc, it'd be exactly the same. Um, nothing from their lore calls out to me here in this stat block. Nothing from their personal characteristics, not even like a charisma talent is present in this gift stat block. And I wish that was more, uh, more obvious. Something like, uh, storytelling, something like calling out to a crowd, something like that would really be a nice touch on this, uh, pretty boring stat block. It's physically capable. It's mechanically perfect, but, um, kind of boring. Anyway. Astral Elves are great. Uh, always love Elves. Auto Gnome is a nice little twist. You can finally make a small construct rather than just relying on a Warforged. Uh, Hadozi are going to be interesting. Uh, very heavily based in mobility, which is uh, going to be fun to watch, honestly. Uh, Plasmoids, can't wait. Can't wait to play one of these. This just sounds like I could... Uh, so many fun things you can do in any encounter, social, or combat. Very fun. And Thry Queen are mechanically very strong, as they deserve. Uh, as they've always deserved. This fits exactly into their um, stat block and uh, previous established lore, and it should be kept that way. Anyway, that's all for me today. This video has gone long. This is what happens when I don't have a script. Um, if you're still around and have been listening from the beginning, very thankful. Um, this is definitely a test. I know people aren't too fond of these long-form videos, but um, I'll try to make individual videos about each of these and really dive into what they can really accomplish. But thanks for listening. I don't have some clever outro, so stay frosty.